Hey, hello, Atif. Oh, I, I see. Oh, everyone is Atif. <laughs> Ernest is also Atif. <laughs> Sorry for being late. You're not late. Hey, Chan Hey, I can't see you. Oh, I can't see you. You can turn on. Hello. Yeah. Um, can you please check the panelists on the screen? Are they already here? I'm here, Chen Gangxi, but I cannot see anyone else. Yes, um, um, this is our Mr. Atif Mian. Can you check yes. all the panelists that if they're already all here? Um, I see three of the four panelists. I'm not seeing Yuan Ang. The other three are here. Can you see me? Hello? Yes, yes. yes I, I see you. Yes. More face. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Yun Yun Eng. Are you here? I don't think she is here. Oh, I don't think. Okay. Okay, Mr. Atif Mian, should we wait for Yun Yun Eng or we can just start? I, I suggest we start. Okay, noted. I'm, I'm emailing her uh, link and reminder. Oh, good. Hello. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today and welcome to the How Did China Develop session. Without any further ado, please welcome our chair, Mr. Atif Mian, to open the session. Mr. Atif Mian, the screen is yours. Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, IEA session on how did China develop. I'm uh, super excited to have um, some uh, of the best scholars on China to talk about the remarkable progress that China made where uh, in uh, about a generation or so, they lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. So what lessons can uh, the rest of the world draw from this incredible progress that China made? That's going to be the topic of conversation. Um, let me uh, quickly introduce the four panelists that um, are going to be with us uh, today. Uh, first is Wei Ying Zhang. He is the Boya Chair Professor of Economics, uh, National School of Development at Peking University. Uh, our second panelist is going to be Yuan Ang. She uh, should be joining us shortly. She is the Associate Professor of Political Science at University of Michigan. And she has two recent books on China. The first is How China Escaped the Poverty Trap. And the second one, more recent one is China's Gilded 
page, The Paradox of Economic Boom and Vast Corruption. Our third panelist is going to be Cheng Gang Ju. Uh, he is the Honorary Professor of Economics at University of Hong Kong and also a visiting professor at Imperial College London. And finally, our fourth panelist is going to be Michael Song, who is the Professor of Economics at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And he is also the co-director of the CUHK Tsinghua Joint Research Center for Chinese Economy. So everyone, welcome. Let me just tell you quickly the ground rules, so to speak. Uh, we will keep the format conversational. I'm going to start off with um, a question each for the four panelists. And all the audience members, you should feel free to write in your questions for the panelists in the chat box, and we will try our best to relay uh, your questions to the to the panelists. So let me, um, without further ado, uh, move to our first uh, panelist. Uh, that's Wei Ying Zhang. Um, Wei Ying, you know, people talk about why China developed, and typically. Uh, there are two competing schools of thought on that question, if you will. The first one says that there is something unique about the Chinese experience, that there is a unique, quote unquote, China model, if you will, uh, that uh, involves a strong one-party rule, maybe support of state-owned enterprises, a strong industrial policy, and so on. So that's one story, one hypothesis, that there is a unique China model. The second um, hypothesis is that there is not something unique to China, but rather China followed an earlier path that was laid down by uh, some of the earlier success stories like the Asian Tigers, but before that Japan, post-war Germany, and perhaps even Britain and France, that like them, they took advantage of markets, exports, su supported um, uh, private entrepreneurship and innovation. So I wanted to ask you um, what your take is on these two competing hypotheses and um, how you see in particular uh, the, the, the hypothesis of the China model. Uh, my view is uh, very simple. Uh, the China model view is a uh, factory force. Uh, China actually followed the uh, more or less universal model. Uh, China model actually take, uh, uses very static model to analyze dynamic uh, process, by which I mean they compare China with the uh, West uh, developed countries uh, of the same, time, same point of time. Uh, but actually, you know, China is uh, uh, in different stage uh, 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 from other countries. Uh, if we look at China, within China, uh, if we use static model, we will get very, very ridiculous uh, conclusion. You know, China, big country, we have uh, 31 provinces, marketization and uh, economic growth varies from region to region. Uh, if we just take a, a one point of time, we may Fight like this. Uh, I I would like to share uh, uh, my oh, there's a problem. Uh, I need uh, to share my PPT, but which is uh, forbidden by. Yeah, uh, just requesting the administrator if they can give give us access to share the screen. Uh, yeah. That would be good. Well, can you wager, but hopefully problem. sometime. Some uh, technical problem. I mean, uh, let me say uh, like this. If we take like, the one year, like uh, 2012, we find it's a marketization and uh, economic growth rate is negatively correlated, you know, very significantly. That means the more marketized uh, regions in China has a lower economic growth rate. Uh, Actually, in past decades, uh, West China uh, has a higher economic growth than East China. But you know, West China in marketization is uh, much lower than uh, East China. Can we get a conclusion that West China has better model than East China 
East China should follow or learn from West China. And this is a quite, quite ridiculous. Actually, we, when we uh, compare economic system, we need to look at dynamically the long process. Yeah, if we just uh, uh, say China, you know, it's a, you know, it's a uh, beginning of reform, no marketization everywhere. But uh, to, uh, like two decades later, East must uh, uh, advance the West in terms of marketization. If we look at the whole two, two decades, we find is uh, actually marketization is uh, positively and significantly correlated with economic growth. Also, if we look at uh, in terms of like ownership uh, of uh, like private or uh, public, but those regions with higher public ownership, higher share of public ownership, had lower economic growth. But those regions with uh, higher private sector had uh, higher economic growth. If we also look at like uh, innovation, like uh, 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 patents and uh, R and D uh, percentage uh, in terms of GDP, we also find those regions with higher private sector, higher foreign out in the prices, or lower uh, uh, state sector, our higher per capita uh, patents, higher per capita, uh, 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 sorry, I mean, higher percentage of uh, R and D. So if we put this together, which is uh, if we look at uh, dynamically, we find there's more marketized, more marketized regions uh, uh, with higher private sector, higher foreign old sector would have a much better economic performance. So that is my key point. That is uh, the China right. model is effectively false. Thank you, Wei Jing. So um, just to summarize, you, you think that the uniqueness of China model is overhyped uh, at some level and what is more likely uh, to be the cause of China's growth or development is that they followed the perhaps the more traditional route yes. of using markets, using private enterprise and, and, and encouraging private innovation and entrepreneurship. And it's exactly those places where we see highest growth rates within China. So there's empirical support for this particular hypothesis as well. Yes. Um, thank you very much for that. I'll come back to you with, with some um, additional questions. Let me move on to uh, Chenggang Yu. Uh, Shengang, um, I want to, uh, you know, uh, Weijing just mentioned the importance of private sector, and there's there's a bit of uh, an um, 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 an enigma uh, if you think about the private sector in the case of China, uh, because if you look at the Chinese constitution, um, it did not even recognize private property until 2004, and that seems rather odd uh, to an outsider, uh, given that unconstitutionality, if you will, of, of private uh, enterprise, how come China used private sector so successfully uh, for promoting growth? So could you uh, fill us in uh, to you know, make sense of this apparent contradiction? Right, uh, let me, uh, okay. Can you, can you see the, uh, my PPT? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good. yeah, right, okay, so, um, I uh, fully agree with uh, Wei Ying just uh, explained. Uh, actually, there's nothing uh, uh, a miracle. So if we uh, uh, look at uh, on the surface, then uh, uh, at the earlier part of this uh, post mao reform, uh, China enjoyed a very high growth rate. Uh, but if we look at uh, what drives the growth, that is the private sector. So that actually makes China different from the reforms in Soviet Union. And so in, in a one way it's not unique in the world because the private sector drives the, uh, drives the growth. On the other hand, it is different uh, from Soviet Union. And, and here, if we look at the, uh, at the legal protection and the private sector, then indeed, it looks like a miracle. So when there was no constitutional right for the private firms, but the private uh, sector uh, grow. So it's created and grow very rapidly. Uh, so 
uh, in uh, facing this uh, challenge, we developed a theory. Here, I've, uh, uh, I'm talking about uh, the paper, uh, Masking Chen and myself uh, in 2000, uh, year 2000. See, in that paper, we provide an explanation. How comes without uh, uh, legal protection, uh, the private sector could grow? So he here, the key is the uh, uh, incentives being provided at that time. Here, I have to emphasize at that time, not always. <laughs> so uh, so uh, in our theory, actually there is an implicit uh, 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 assumption or condition, uh, which means that uh, the government must have only one objective. So if the government has many objectives, then this, re this uh, kind of incentive is not going to work. So in general, no government in the world would have only one objective, which is the GDP growth. It's impossible. So therefore, this kind of uh, incentive in general is going to fail. So then the question is, when this incentive fails, what is going to happen? So how to solve the incentive problems of the governments? So then we are facing, so in China, we are facing this dilemma. So I call that as a private sector's dilemma. So on the one hand, the private sector is indispensable, but on the other hand, the state sector must dominate. So this is uh, in the constitution. Uh, so therefore here, uh, and, and also the incentives uh, uh, is not there anymore. Uh, so then the private sector development in, overall in, uh, in all the other countries, are going to rely on the rule of law. But the rule of law implies or relies on judicial independence, but China doesn't have that. So how could China solve this problem? Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, talk about this uh, in a later part of this conversation. Great, yeah, look, look, look forward to that. Let me, let me continue with that question of uh, the, the private sector for China with uh, our next panelist, Michael Song. Uh, Michael, as we have talked about, the importance of private sector is very obvious uh, in China's uh, growth process. Um, how, in your view, did the private sector manage to thrive even under uh, some of the weak economic institutions that Cheng Gang has already mentioned? Yes. <clears throat> First of all, I fully agree with uh, what uh, uh, Wei Ying just uh, said, you know, uh, market and, you know, uh, market oriented reforms uh, seem to be uh, very important for, for China's growth. Uh, no question about that. But what I'm going to say is that the message is actually a bit subtle. Because if you, if you think about uh, uh, market imperfections in China, you, you, you can name many of them. As uh, Chen Gang just uh, said, that uh, even the basic property rights uh, are not fully respected in China, not to mention you know, financial frictions, uh, tons of uh, entry barriers, regulations, uh, uh, red tape. The list can go very, very long. But of course, uh, China is no different to many other developing countries. Uh, in most developing countries, you see a lot of uh, imperfections. But the real challenge, I, I mean, uh, brought by China's past economic success to the mainstream thought is uh, how could be the case that China has uh, such a thriving private sector without you know, uh, solid formal institutions? So our take to this is uh, actually China has uh, endogenously developed some kind of uh, informal institutions, so what we call special deals. So in a way, it's uh, quite similar to what Chen Gang said, uh, you know, uh, this is a country uh, in which uh, 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 you see very strong state capacity. Many local governments, uh, they are very powerful. They have a lot of resources, uh, so many resources uh, that, that no uh, other countries, uh, no go local governments in other countries can match. So that's one thing. A another thing is, uh, 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 it's also echoing what Chen Gang said, that uh, uh, local officials, uh, they, they are very much incentivized to uh, help you know entrepreneurs to to develop uh, a local economy for whatever is there are a variety of reasons why they would like to do so say some people argue that's a career concern uh, some people say that uh, you know th these officials are intrinsically motivated uh, and some people say that they're just corrupt 
but for whatever reason, they just have a huge incentives to 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 do to to do this thing. And also, it's also related to what Chen Gang said that many many uh, there, there are many many local governments uh, doing the same thing. In a way, they are competing with each other. So uh, that's uh, how you know uh, this informal institutions can actually serve as a substitute to formal institutions like market. You know, to reallocate resources that that were capital controlled by the state to to the private sector. I think that uh, channel actually, uh, or you know, more precisely, this uh, informal institutions actually play a very important role uh, in uh, helping China to overcome uh, those inefficiencies f in uh, in the formal institutions. And you know, uh, I think uh, uh, the big challenge and opportunity uh, faced by the Chinese economy. Uh, in the next uh, few years uh, are also closely related to uh, 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 this informal institution. If we have time, we, we can get back to this. Thanks. Um, since we are uh, talking about the private sector, let me come back to Cheng Gang and then I'll, I'll go back to Wei Ying after that. Um, Cheng Gang, you know, uh, Michael talked about the importance of these informal institutions in, in, in supporting private markets. Uh, what is your view on the relationship between China's uh, judicial system and perhaps even their political system and the private sector? Um, and, and, you know, if you want to talk about the banking sector um, as well, uh, you could. But, you know, could you help us gain further insight into why or how the private sector has uh, thrived um, in terms of its, uh, you know, interplay with the judicial and the political system? Right. Um, yeah, so we, we uh, for uh, discussing this matter, uh, we have to uh, come back uh, to the uh, uh, to the uh, uh, history a little bit. Uh, so for understanding the Chinese uh, uh, judicial system, <clears throat> so the, actually uh, the Ch uh, China implanted uh, the Soviet type of judicial system. Uh, in the early 50s. So basically China copied, translated, and trained uh, uh, legal experts, uh, judges uh, by Soviet Union. And uh, uh, so implementing this kind of a Soviet type of system, the key is that uh, the judicial system is an instrument of the Communist Party. Uh, and another important thing is the Cultural Revolution, which dismantled the whole judicial system, dismantled the law, dismantled judicial system. So then the only after, since the post-war reform, uh, the Soviet type of judicial system was rebuilt. Uh, so the courts were just rebuilt uh, under the leadership of the party uh, since uh, 1978. And the, uh, the criminal law was only passed in 1979. And that the Chinese even didn't have a civil, civil codes at that time. So only in 1986, uh, China passed the civil code. Uh, and here, uh, the important message is that uh, the 1986 civil code of the PRC is actually a, a sort of a translation from Soviet Union. Why should I say that? Why should I emphasize that? The key message here is that because the Soviet Union does not recognize private property rights, so therefore the civil code passed in 1986 does not recognize uh, uh, private ownership either. So in that civil code, they only recognize the legal persons as owner. They don't recognize a natural person as owner. So here, both in the constitution and in the civil codes, there is no legal provision for protecting private property rights. So that's the key I'm emphasizing. And, uh, uh, and uh, also another important thing is that uh, yeah, in China, everything is a, a, a sort of a decentralized to regions. So the party controls the uh, uh, ideology and the personnel, uh, but all the details are managed uh, locally. So even the courts, including the courts. So the regional courts are actually part of the uh, state, uh, uh, par part of this party state uh, at the same level. 
Uh, so then only in 2004, uh, the constitution, uh, start, the Chinese constitution recognized uh, uh, private property rights. But that is only a principle. That is not, that cannot be implemented without uh, 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 civil codes. So as I mentioned that uh, in a, a civil code, they recognize only legal person. They don't recognize a natural person. So only in 2017, just uh, two, uh, three years ago, uh, the uh, civil code was changed. So then they uh, recognize a, a natural person. But these are only about uh, uh, laws in the paper. Uh, so then the implementation of the law uh, implementation of a protection, uh, protecting private property rights uh, 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 relies on uh, the courts, relies on uh, uh, the judge. So then we also have to look at uh, uh, how uh, the uh, courts are operating. So then here there is a very big event in 2014. Uh, uh, that's uh, 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 the Communist Party's uh, uh, the fourth plenary session of the 18th Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party. So they, here the key message of this, uh, uh, of this plenary session is the so-called governance according to law. So it, internationally, this is a, a not a common language. So what is the meaning of a governance according to law? So the summary is very simple. That means rule by law. That means that uh, the, the, the Communist Party, the Chinese government wants to use the law and use the court as the instrument to govern. And here, let me cite what uh, uh, Chairman Xi has said at that time. So he said, the law is a strong weapon for ruling the country. So actually what he said here is very clear. <laughs> it's crystal clear. Uh, and uh, also uh, 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 in their document, they said that the party leads the legislation and the party controls the law enforcement and the party is going to decide the, the whole direction of uh, building uh, uh, this uh, uh, governance according to law. So the, the, the message is that the court uh, is, a, a, is a instrument uh, of the party. And then here we have another important message, which is in the constitution. The constitution says that uh, the state upholds the basic economic system in which the public ownership is dominant. So that's in the constitution. So then I have, a, I am going to leave a question here uh, for the next uh, uh, conversation. So my question is then how about the private sector under the governance according to law, right? So here, let me just uh, uh, briefly summarize what I said. So on the one hand, uh, the, here, the key uh, about the legal system is the governance according to law, is a rule by law. On the other hand, uh, 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 in, the, in the constitution, uh, they made it clear that the state sector is going to dominate, uh, but uh, the private sector is indispensable. So then how about the private sector? under this kind of situation. Fascinating, uh, Chenggang. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's obviously a different environment than uh, many other places in the, in, in the world. Um, Wei Zheng, uh, you know, let me come back to you. We talked about in the beginning the, the uh, importance or not of the China model. Um, to the extent China did follow um, a unique path, um, you know, maybe, around uh, uh, dominance mm -hmm. of state or enterprises and so on. Um, do you feel it is actually harmful for China's economic prosperity to follow the so-called China model as opposed to you know, follow the more traditional route of <laughs> development from one stage to the next and so on? Uh, yes, uh, but first let me end uh, a point to uh, Chung Gang's uh, and Michael's argument. What is the property rights? Property rights are not just the legal documents, uh, but actually people's expectation, like what they believe, what will happen. Like in 1980s, 
you know, there are many, uh, 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 we call the uh, red, uh, call the red cap uh, a firm, which means uh, the register is a collective uh, firm, but uh, actually owned by uh, private. Why people did that? Because they expect, you know, China will change, will give more room for private sector. So the first register at that time is because the private, sec uh, uh, private firm were not legally permitted. Then the register is a collective firm then they understand that one day they can privatize their own firm. So I mean, the expectation is very, very important for people's behavior. If today we still and public ownership dominates, if you believe in future, private will be a law. So you will do something, you will do your business now. So that is, I think, uh, one point I like to uh, end it. Now I'll come to your question, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's every country actually is different from other countries. In this sense, yeah, there is a China model, Pakistan model, American model, British model, you know. But uh, what I mean is I reject a uh, 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 China model because it's a basic logic, basic underlying forces for China's high growth are same as other countries. Now, why this is harmful, uh, uh, China model will is harmful to China. Uh, we can take uh, this analysis. Uh, so if you see some, uh, uh, someone run very fast, you also see him lost one arm. Then you conclude that he ran fast because he lost his arm. That's totally wrong. So if you, if you think this is the right argument, you will encourage all other people to cut off his arms. That would be a disaster. So when we look at China, we need to make a distinction between in spite of and uh, because of. Many people, uh, particularly China model supporters, take uh, in spite of as because of. Actually, China developed fast in spite of uh, one party system, instead of uh, a strong uh, state sector, instead of government strong intervention, uh, even uh, like uh, 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 through industry policy. But not, that is not the reason for China's growth, China's success. That China developed, in spite of this factor, because China developed the private sector, China marketized its economy. Uh, compared to a uh, uh, plant system. Um, private sector, private and prices had more incentive to do their business. But this is, I think, very relevant. If we believe China model is right, then people, a uh, Chinese, Chinese government, uh, Chinese people will follow China model. That's like, all, oh, we develop more, more state sector. We will introduce more government intervention. We will also industry policy to develop our country. Then that would uh, make China, you know, uh, a bad disaster. And I like to hear, to quote uh, Hai Ke's saying, uh, I remember uh, uh, his basic idea like this, uh, the facts alone cannot tell us what is right, what is wrong. But our wrong notion of what is right, what is wrong, will change facts. Uh, quote this, uh, if we understand uh, China's success wrongly, we will follow the wrong model. So we will change China. China will not have good future. So that is something I worry about it. Thanks, uh, Wei Jing. Uh, this, this is uh, uh, fascinating, your, your point that, you know, we should not con con confuse in spite of as uh, the cause of. Um, I want to uh, sort of, you know, lead into um, uh, that idea and um, go to Michael Song. Um, Michael, how, what is your take on like looking, you know, Beijing was talking about going forward and, you know, we should not confuse uh, the correlation of high state involvement as somehow depicting that that's the cause of uh, China's growth. Um, how, what is your opinion about the, the future of uh, Chinese economy and in particular, uh, what are the challenges and opportunities, in your view, facing uh, China's future? 
Yeah, so uh, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, say something uh, about, you know, what uh, uh, Chen Gao and Wei Ying uh, just uh, said. So if you think about uh, uh, what are the key elements in formal institutions, uh, so one is the uh, private properties and the other uh, uh, markets, uh, about markets. So um, when it comes to private property rights protection, I think it's uh, more related to kind of incentives. Um, in the past, you know, as we said, that the expectation was uh, pretty okay. So we know things are moving towards the right direction and uh, you see a lot of incentives. The Chinese people worked very hard, they saved a lot, uh, uh, you know, they just want to get rich. And now uh, the uncertainty is increasing. Um, but even without too much of improvement in you know, private uh, property rights protection, I think I still see a lot of incentives. I still see you know, Chinese people saving a lot, probably a bit less, but still you know, compared with many other countries, the saving rate is uh, extraordinarily high. And you know, the hours they would like to work are also uh, uh, very high. And uh, so they still have a very strong incentive to, to get rich or richer. So that's the one thing I want to say, because, you know, this is very important for us to understand the future of China. I think that there are many good reasons to believe, you know, uh, uh, China's still going to have all these kind of necessary conditions for high growth or reasonably high growth in the, in the future. But the thing that really worries me is about markets. That's, a, that's a, you know, th th think, think about the, here, here is what's happening in China. Um, just think about the high saving rate. Um, you see tons of uh, uh, deposits have been put into the financial uh, sector, which is uh, dominated by state-owned uh, financial institutions. And the deposit GDP ratio uh, has been growing very high. Now it probably have, uh, has reached like 200%. Now the question is really about, you know, uh, given the more and more resources controlled by the state, uh, do we really have a efficient mechanism to, to allocate these uh, resources? In the past, you know, we rely very much on this informal institution, uh, say that, you know, uh, some officials or local governments are incentivized to reach out to entrepreneurs. And that, that's why you see, you know, uh, efficiency is improve, has been uh, improving over time. But now... Uh, we have to think twice about the implications of uh, such practice because, you know, informal institutions is like a double-edged sword. It, it can improve efficiency. It can also make things worse. For instance, you know, if the resources are just stuck with the, those uh, uh, better connected guys, then those are leaving unconnected guys behind, then, you know, uh, you may uh, see uh, worsening of uh, uh, resource allocation efficiency. And actually, that's... Uh, that's um, Exactly the reason why I think, you know, uh, uh, China's uh, productivity growth in the past the decade has been on a steady uh, uh, downward trend. It's, uh, it's very worrisome. In the past, it was very, very high, like uh, three uh, or four percent. People used to think, you know, China was a, a investment driven economy. It's not entirely correct. Correct. Actually, before the financial crisis, the TIP growth was a very important contributor to China's growth. But now, you know, much of the TIP growth uh, has disappeared. Now we are talking about TIP growth uh, like one or two percent. And why this is the case, so just we see uh, a lot more misallocation. And I think it, it basically goes back to, to the thing, can we rely really on this informal institution? It was very successful in the past, but you know, there's always a limit for uh, how far you know, such an informal institution can go. So I think you know, uh, um, if you ask me what is the biggest challenge uh, for, for China, that is, you know, uh, uh, it's probably more related to the legacy of the informal institution. How do we just get around this and develop our own, improve our own formal institution? Well, and that also uh, comes uh, the greatest opportunity, I think. That is, uh, um, uh, think about we still have a lot of room to improve, to develop our formal institution. Mm -hmm. You know, at least on paper, I think the Chinese government has agreed, you know, to uh, what they call the let market uh, uh, play a key role in allocating resources. Whether or not, you know, that can be done, I think, you know, to, to, to make a formal institution better and better, it's, uh, it's a long march. It takes years, if not decades, right? Uh, uh, but 
if uh, there is a consensus that you know the market is going to play an important role in the future and you know they should respect to this promise i think that's uh, probably make uh, you know uh, uh, china's growth so will look more sustainable uh, in the future we can get back to this uh, you know this is a fascinating topic right, right. Uh, thanks uh, chang kang let me um, move to you with uh, sort of a similar related question michael talked about a potential concern um, as to the feasibility of you know using the same informal mechanisms for sustaining growth in the future uh, markets may not work very well questions around allocation of resources and related productivity growth in china um, how do you see uh, china's uh, future um, and especially are there things that you worry about looking into uh, the future in terms of uh, you know the sustainability of china's growth model Right. Um, actually, uh, the slowing down of the Chinese economy uh, has uh, many things to do with the uh, troubles in the private sector. So, can you see this graph? Yes. So, in the graph here, this is the private sector investment, and the dark blue is the investment of the state sector. So here you can see that on the one hand, the private sector is the uh, majority of the Chinese economy. But on the other hand, in the recent decade, the investment of the private sector has been declining, and particularly after 2014. So we, then we, we, on the one hand, we worry this. On the other hand, we want to understand this. What happens? So how comes, so on the one hand, uh, you have uh, here, you have many billionaires, uh, but uh, you find the private sector invest less, less and less, and they are <coughs> declining. Uh, so now let us, uh, uh, so I'm going to show you a, uh, uh, I'm going to show you a uh, work in progress, uh, which we try to, Disciple. Uh, so this is a <clears throat> work in progress with the colleagues at the Imperial College. Uh, so we here we uh, uh, look at uh, all the court cases and all the Chinese firms. And uh, we uh, here I have to thank uh, Michael for sharing the data with us. <laughs> uh, so. With a huge amount of work, so here we got uh, 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 more than one million cases involving all the all the firms in China. So it's not it's it's not a sampling sample; it's a population. And uh, here we find we we want to find uh, if if the court is fair in dealing with uh, the state firms and dealing with the private firms. So here you can see that uh, at the national level, uh, there is a huge bias. So that's the national level. So there's a huge bias and the statistically is highly significant. And also we can look at the provinces. So in the provinces, actually uh, here it echoes what uh, we just said uh, at the very beginning. So in the provinces where you have the most developed uh, uh, economies, then you have uh, most of the, uh, 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 you, you have a strong uh, biasness against the private sector. So for example, uh, 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 so if, if you look at, uh, uh, if you look at uh, 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 Zhejiang, Guangdong, uh, Shanghai, and uh, in the less developed area, uh, uh, the biasness is uh, uh, lighter. Uh, so, so basically here, what we find is that uh, the court is a biased. So when the court is a biased, then it's going to destroy the confidence of the private owners. So when the confidence of the private owners are affected, then they invest less. So roughly, this is uh, 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 what we are doing. Thank you, Dennis. This is fascinating, uh, Chengeng, by the way. I, I, I want to move uh, to uh, Wei Ying with the same 
question. Um, let me just say as an outsider, I mean, I, this, is, this is really a, a sort of a, a eye-opening for me because I did not realize that Chinese scholars are kind of questioning the, maybe the sustainability or the, you know, continued yeah. uh, growth of the private sector as, as, as much as uh, people on the panel are questioning. What is your take on the future of China and perhaps with particular reference to the private sector? Uh, I have something to worry about. Uh, reason is uh, uh, China has changed in its uh, ideology and direction of reform in the past few years. Uh, this is related to what we talked about the China model. I would like to uh, on the one, I, I think, yeah, let me, I wrote an article a few years ago, which called uh, my personal experience of three industry revolutions. My personal experience, when I was born, all my clothes was handmade by mother, my mother, you know. <laughs> That was, uh, you know, you know, machine clothes was, uh, you know, two, more than 200 years ago happened. But in China, you know, when I was born, I was still not uh, yet, you know. So why China developed so far? That is because China, with the openness and reform, absorbed all 300 years uh, technology accumulated in West. Now this, you know, diminishing. You know, I mean, uh, when China has already use this uh, accumulated technology. Field of China must depends on how China can do innovation. It's a serious, not just a borrow, not just a copy other countries. Now this economic growth will naturally slow down. You know, I, I call the uh, upchart economy uh, can grow fast, but the innovation economy cannot grow very fast. Maybe the three or four percent is most. But uh, you know, uh, an upcharge economy can grow like nine, ten percent because you are late car 